For more on this, let's bring in Ivan Elan from Washington. He's a senior fellow at the Independent Institute and the author of The Failure of Counterinsurgency, Why Hearts and Minds Are Not Always One. Lots being accomplished at this NATO meeting, Ivan. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, first of all, let's talk about the situation in Ukraine. What do you make of this ceasefire? Well, of course, we don't know if it's going to hold, as your report indicated. Uh, previous attempts have, been, have failed. And the other question is, can uh, the rebels be uh, controlled even if Russia wants to uh, settle the conflict? Because these rebels, uh, certainly they are supplied by Moscow, but they, are, they are also have acted very independently as well. What about the timing of this ceasefire? I mean, it, was it planned to come around the NATO meeting? Was, is Putin that uh, uh, clever uh, to, to try and time it for that? Or was it the fact that sanctions against Russia were actually starting to work? Well, sanctions are a long-term thing, so I think Putin is definitely trying to play with the alliance, weaken the cohesion, and weaken the the, uh, the resolve to go forward with more sanctions. So I think it was, it, Putin did this on purpose. Now, uh, you know, we could see the uh, ceasefire evaporate after the after the NATO meeting is over, too. So uh, I, nothing is guaranteed until the ceasefire takes hold and has an effect, and and the, and the U.S. starts. Uh, uh, and the West starts pulling off sanctions. But I think that's a ways down the road, as the president indicated. They're going to watch what happens on the ground. And, uh, you know, they may actually uh, put, put more sanctions on in the meantime. So uh, I don't think anything is a guarantee at this point. If the ceasefire does indeed hold, what does the future look like for Ukraine? I mean, will they have to negotiate some kind of uh, new borders? Uh, will there be talks between the eastern part of the country and, and the people who seem to want to stay more under Russian control? How will that work? Will we see a wall? We've even heard talk of a wall a la the Berlin Wall going up. Well, I think uh, the, the settlement is probably going to have to be some sort of a federalized structure, meaning that the eastern part of Ukraine would have autonomy and Russia would have some influence there. But, you know, great powers have always uh, had influence in their sphere of influence, and uh, that's why they call it a sphere of influence. But, um, you know, uh, I think that uh, the, those people in eastern Ukraine, many of them would probably like to be associated with Russia and somehow, or at least autonomous from the government in Ukraine. Uh, so I think that's the ultimate solution, whether uh, that can be done in practice is another matter. Uh, the, you know, oftentimes, as in the Israeli-Palestinian dispute, the solution by by experts is clearly there, uh, but the, getting the parties to agree to it is another matter. What does this say about NATO itself and its members in terms of coming out on a very united front, very strong against both what is happening in Ukraine and, and what is happening with the Islamic State? I mean, they also came up with something called a rapid response force that would be somewhere in Europe to try and uh, repel any further aggression by um, non-NATO members. Does NATO come out looking positive in this whole thing, strong, determined? Well, I think... I think uh, that's what they're trying to look like. But if you look, scratch the surface, this re rapid reaction force is only 4,000 troops. Russia has local superiority uh, in around Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, the Baltics, and you know Poland, that sort of thing. Uh, this is in Russia's neck of the woods. That Russians can always get more troops there faster than the United States can, and that's why. Many people, when they expanded NATO that far, said, well, you know, you're doing it for political reasons to get these countries from the east to the west in the western camp, but how are you going to defend these countries uh, adequately? And about the only way you can really defend the Baltics is with nuclear weapons. And uh, that's kind of scary because you don't, that's where you don't want to go to escalate to the nuclear level. So NATO has always had a problem. And they're thinking about it. Uh, they've uh, invited 12 countries after the Cold War to join. 12 countries did join in three waves of expansion. And they're still planning on uh, taking more in. And, I, you know, the United States, this is not a mutual uh, defense alliance. The United States does provide the security mm -hmm. for most of these European members of NATO. Not necessarily. It's less acute for Canada, of course, over here. But, uh, you know, the threats are all over in Europe. And they're very far forward, these countries, to defend. And uh, militarily, it's very difficult to do and would be very costly. We have to leave it at that in the interest of time, Ivan. But thank you so much. Appreciate you coming on.